of Colorado Springs. Um, it's titled Profiting from the Peak. And uh, he's, he's going to talk about his chapter on God and place in Colorado Springs. That's next week. And I think the week after that, we go to um, single service, which means that anybody coming to forum has to come an hour and a half before church. So I'm hoping I'll see uh, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so when we go to one service, I'm hoping you'll make a point of getting here early. And now, let's see if I can find Sky or our speaker, who are both here. We'll go to that next. So I'll just wait a second for that. Um, I think that's it. So we've got John Hazelhurst coming in December. Uh, we've got Richard Scorman coming in January. Um, we've got a pretty good lineup. So, and we just got our, uh, another member, uh, Reverend Dr. Douglas Sharp, has now joined the uh, forum team. So, uh, we we are finally at uh, a full four-person team for the first time in quite a few years. And now I will introduce Sky to introduce our guest for the day. Who stepped out to make a phone call, and I don't know where he can't, he can't have gone far because that's his coat. <laughs> um, here he goes. Here he goes, Sky. Oh. And it has to be pretty pretty close to you to be heard. Everyone hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Whoa. Um, you may have heard Sergio Popovich before. He's spoken in this church before. Uh, although I think it's been there. It's, it's been uh, several years. Um, Sergio is uh, a famous man. <laughs> and a good friend. I'm paying you to say that. Yeah, no, no. Uh, Sergio's fame is, um, I'm only going to read you a whole bio that you had with you, but his fame begins really with the. Uh, Nonviolent protest movement that he co founded, uh, the student movement that brought down Milosevic in. There he is, along with. Milosevic himself, right? Slobodan Genovic over here, who snuck in, fresh from Belgrade. Um, Sergio says that Slobo is showing up just to critique uh, Sergio and tease him for speaking in a church, but that's. I'll, I'll leave that between the two of them. But these two gentlemen made uh, uh, a lot of noise, literally, in bringing down Milosevic. After that, Slobo went off to make money, which he's done successfully. Sergio went off as a member of parliament, less successful, or at least less happy. Uh, and the two of them together founded the Center for Applied Nonviolence Actions and Strategies, aka Canvas. And you can find the website at canvasopedia.org. Uh, Serge has written a lot of books, a lot of pamphlets. They've been training activists all over the world. I think from, uh, what are we now, 46 countries, sir? Something like that? Something like that? 46 different countries. Uh, there, is a non, there is an online course from the Kennedy School at Harvard teaching all sorts of people around the world who sometimes sign up with, who are otherwise famous but sign up with pseudonyms. Um, Sergio is very active. Not his latest book, but my favorite, Blueprint for Revolution, with a Banksy cartoon on the front. Uh, subtitle, How to Use Rice Pudding, Lego Men, and Other Nonviolent Techniques to Galvanize Communities, Overthrow Dictators, or Simply Change the World. I don't know that we're in the business of overthrowing dictators, but I think we are in the business of simply changing the world. Um, so the only other thing I'm going to say to introduce Sergio is that we are all very fortunate. Slobo has joined us. He got tied up a year ago with, with visas and travel restrictions and all sorts of things. Uh, Sergio and his uh, wife and two children, Masha, Moma, and Leah, um, did beat the travel restrictions, and Sergio is now a resident, and his family are now residents of Colorado Springs, which makes me particularly happy. So without any further ado, Hello, hello. Oh, I don't need that. I have one arm in my neck. Uh, hello, hello. Good to be here again. Uh, thanks, Kai, for, for inviting me to this wonderful place. Uh, I was a little bit nervous because I didn't know, shall I play organs, sing in the Four. Don't laugh, that would be awful. <laughs> that will hurt. 
that will hurt a lot. Uh, good to be back here, uh, good to be in this place that uh, me and my family now call home. Uh, thank you for spending part of your lovely Monday morning. On this, if I would be you, I would rather be fishing. But good to see you all. So uh, let me start with a little bit of a, of a background. As Sky said, uh, yeah, I did well, well. Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about a few things. When we were preparing this thing, we're like, okay, how can we cover things that are interesting but not too politically slippery? As you know, America is now very politically divided. And I assume a lot of questions will be covering the American situation. So instead of being a foreigner who comes and telling you what's happening in your country, I'll be speaking a little bit about what we do across the globe and uh, give you a little bit of a blueprint for changing the world because this is what Sky particularly demanded from me. And then uh, touch a little bit of where we are now with uh, movements and dictators and democracy and human rights and what we learned and what have changed. And then, then you will take the lead, and I will try to answer some of your questions. Make sense? Okay. So without further ado, uh, I'll start. There is a friend who brought sold the meat to Harvard, whose name is Marshall Gantz. He's a famous uh, American activist now teaching Harvard, and he always says if you want to buy people's attention, you need to structure your presentation around three things the story of self, the story of now, and the story of us. So I'll start with the story of myself. Next one. This is me, when I was 19. That's Fender Precision bass guitar. Very, very good piece of, of uh, uh, musical instrument. Uh, when I was 19 and Slobo was 17, uh, we were growing in a beautiful country named Yugoslavia. Uh, known to be the most westernized Eastern European country. Uh, cool term to explain it was the Coca-Cola socialism. So we had a little bit of a universal health care and a nice communist party in power. But at the same time we have freedoms, middle class, good music, travel the globe. When I was born, you saw passport was the most expensive passport on the world's black market because that was the only one that can bring you to Moscow and Washington DC during the Cold War without having a visa. So, happy childhood, uh, typical teenager ideas. Uh, when I was about that age, I thought the activism is, uh, you know, for boring old people who fight for rights for dogs and things of that kind. So not really a political kind of stuff. Uh, I was more into fishing and playing in the band and dating and, you know, the things that teenagers do. And then in 1989-1990, a uh, pretty bad guy named Slobodan Milosevic came to power with his amazing ideas of how to turn a successful country to five small, ridiculous countries after the four civil wars. So he was a real visionary. Within the 11 years of reign, he successfully screwed up the country we were born in. He replaced uh, feeling of globalism and being internationally recognized with uh, isolation, hatred for neighbors. He started and lost four civil wars. Mm. Uh, he grew medium-sized middle-class country into the country with, at the moment, the second largest hyperinflation in the world. You would get your salary at 3 p.m. If you don't spend it till tomorrow, it will work half. I'm having a really good time reading how Americans are concerned about their 6% inflation. It was 6% a second where I was there. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we witnessed amazing things. I witnessed friends leaving the country uh, because there was no perspective. If Slobo is on this stage, but he's preparing his voice because he's going to sing later. Uh, he would say that when he entered the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering to build ships, that was the most uh, prospective job in the country. Average, uh, average time waiting for a job after you graduate was about three months. So you graduate three months after, you have a job in a shipyard, a good engineering job. Before he was on the third year, the last shipyard in, in Yugoslavia closed. So, you don't have perspective, you see things shrinking, you have to 
different solutions to fight or to flee. Obviously, we were the stubborn ones, so unlike uh, most of our generation, we haven't fled. Then, next one, Arvind. What we figured out is that there is nobody else to do the job. Uh, we had an incapable political opposition, we had international community that was uh, treating my country basically as this experimental rat. So they would be doing photo opportunities with Milosevic one week, second week they were introduced the sanctions, third week they will invite him for negotiation, the fourth week they will strengthen the section, finally 999. They tried that uh, lovely, super successful Afghanistan Iraq scenario with bombing my country uh, in 1999, killing 4.5 thousand civilians, but didn't really work. Uh, it took the common people that I love to call hobbits to mobilize, organize, and figure out that we have to do this. So, after unsuccessful demonstrations 1992, successful demonstrations 1996, 1997, in 1998, we decided to create a movement which was called Otpor, Serbian word for resistance, starting with 11 people and growing to 20,000 daily active people. For a comparison, Serbia is like Colorado, 7.5 million. So imagine having a 20,000 strong movement in Colorado. That's a lot of people. Through this process, we learned a lot. Uh, first of all, we learned where we are making a mistake. And uh, some of these learnings uh, became a tool that we spent the past 15 years uh, giving, sharing, selling to the movements across the globe. Uh, ideally, the idea that we had was that, uh, yes, mobilizing the youth was important, and mobilizing urban centers were important, but it's not where the people really live. So this movement didn't really become viable until it involved elderly people, until it built into the provinces, and until it uh, understood uh, how the strategy comes before the tactics. One of the things we very often see with the movements across the globe is that they start with tactics. They get super outraged with the assassination of George Floyd. Millions of them come in the street. The churches are putting Black Lives Matter banner. You know what I'm talking about? But then when you ask them what you really want, they come to something really tactical, like defunding the police. So we'll, we'll discuss this, this tactics versus strategy thing. And we are discussing it a lot, and actually last week, so when we had a marvelous opportunity to share this idea with amazing students from Colorado College that we teach, I think, 15 years now. And digging deeper into this, we need to understand that for a systemic change, institutions should be changed. So anger, mobilization, it's all nice, but it's not enough. You need a strategy to change things. Working on this strategy, we start getting invitations from people from weird places. Sometimes these were the weird places we could find on the map. 2003, 2004, we worked a lot with Zimbabweans, with Ukrainians, with Georgians. Sometimes it were the places we couldn't even find on the map. 2006, we found ourselves commuting in a speedboat between the islands in the Maldives. Maldives were the first country, 100% Muslim that achieved democracy through popular movement in 2008. Unfortunately, the world wasn't really paying attention, so everybody was caught by surprise with the Arab Spring. Through these 15 years, we tried to cut down the principles of success, see where the movements are making mistakes, and try to develop different toolkits. This book is one of them, but we also did probably 15 different publications, including videos and instructional stuff throughout the time. So what we have learned, where are we now? And now we move from story of me into story of us. And that's the next slide. <coughs> so it's really thrilling uh, working for democracy. And, but as Winston Churchill's son very often clever said, However good the strategy may look, you may occasionally take a look at the results. Well, this is the results. We are living in a world where for 15 years, democracy is on the decay. 
This is one of the indexes that measure democracy and human rights across the globe. What you see is the number of the countries where democracy increased versus number of the countries where democracy decreased. As you can see, the 2005 was the last year when more countries progressed in human rights and democracy than regress. And then this minus shows you the number of the countries, relative to the number of the countries where democracy progressed. 2020 pandemic year being the worst in this moment. So how this happens? Uh, did movements lose the steam? Did the dictators become smart? The answer is no. Unfortunately, 80% of democracy decrease comes from democracies. So we are witnessing the model of gradual death of democracy being attacked by the cancer that one of uh, the leaders of this non-democratic movement, Viktor Orban, in Europe calls illiberal democracy. So yes, we have elections, yes, we come with power, but then we use this power to stop judiciary with our own people, to stuff media with our own people, to restrict movement of the opponent, to fragile the opposition, to go into the us and them divisions, because people are easily ruled when divided. Divide et impera is a Latin quote, which probably 2.5 thousand years old now. And then you take a look at place where you had democracy, Venezuela, and I have a one of the world dictatorships in Latin America. Now take a look at the Turkey, Erdogan was celebrated for ending the era of the coup. Now this is the country with the largest number of arrested journalists, for example. Take a look at it. In the heart of European Union, you have Orban. In the east, you have the master of it, Duterte of Philippines, whose daughter is going to run for the president. Now, what a surprise. And then, of course, I, I, I lost a big head of a guy named Bolsonaro in Brazil. But I, there was a little bit place to squeeze the master of them all. Vladimir Putin, the person who invented the toolbox of dividing society, making people apathetic, and even expanding his war of truth. The new dictators are not fighting against the opposition. They are fighting to destroy the middle. Because if middle doesn't exist, everything is possible. From your slides, what is the people that can't move those tiny streets? What is the red side? What is that red? Minus three countries. So three countries more decreased in democracy. 16 countries more decrease in democracy compared to the number of the country that increased human rights. So for every achievement and transition in a place like Sudan, you have a coup in Burma and one in Guinea. <laughs> so it's like when you take a look at, at these kind of stuff. For every little thing achieved in Tunisia, you have a five media outlets killed in Turkey. So this is the idea is that balance is unfortunately weighing on our side. So we'll speak a bit about the misinformation and world through and how it plays into this thing. Now let's take a look at how movements adapt. Uh, when you were young and Slovo and me were young, which was about the same age or a little bit further back in history, majority of the movements were built on organizations. So you have a labor union, you have student organization, you have something in the middle, the core of it. Now, according to the guy whom I stole this slide from, Ben Brass, there's a guy who tracks the world protests. And there is a thing called protest tracker on the internet, really interesting thing. Contemporary movements are really different animals. First of all, they don't start with the organization. They are not issue-based thing. You don't have a lovely ladies coming to our class two years before they want to put 2C on the referendum and thinking how to build a movement that will make Coloradans give up 0.000025% of their tax to improve taxes. It's very different things. They start with trigger. So boom, something happens. Once again, assassination of George Floyd is a really good idea. Then it spreads horizontal. So it's a very different thing than building the organization from cities into the provinces. Now I have internet, everything goes on fire. 
the numbers grow super fast and the growth of numbers and Slova is our data man is not compatible or, or it's not comparable with the growth of organization. So before you have an organization to capture this, you have protests all over the country. Then the level of individualism and ownership in your movement is very different. Because you don't have a sound strategy and a common organization and some kind of hierarchical background, you have a lot of ownership. This is actually good because people come with their own ideas. But these protests are very difficult to suppress because your opponent can't tell where the next outburst will be. And last but not least importance, they're very difficult to manage. So you have individual local groups doing things as they think they can do. Sometimes, like last year, the first thing I've seen last August in Colorado Springs was a BLM event in uh, Acacia Park with a lot of uh, sandwiches, hot dogs, good music, and masks saying whatever, well, if you want to change things, vote. And then at the same time in Seattle, you have people barricading themselves and burning buildings. So that tells you how difficult it is to unify this type of movement. So on the good side, more ownership, difficult to suppress, a lot of ideas coming in on the bad side, very difficult to unify around the strategy or maintain discipline or these kind of stuff. So let go, let's go further. So I'm just going to do this a little bit of what we learn and what makes successful social movement for dummies. And we were, we were, we were really uh, looking into the principles and trying to cut it down into something that can be sold to TED or even some elevator pitch because we think it's really important to outline these kind of stuff. So, first of all, what their movements are different. Yeah, yeah, but so yeah. Movements are different, uh, conditions are different, but you need to know your value. So if you want to change things in Colorado Springs, you need to listen to the people of Colorado Springs. You need to figure out that there are people supporting change, that there are people opposing change. You try to see why they are supporting or opposing change. That will bring you to the understanding that there is a journey in front of you. Your journey is to start with the idea, go to the lowest hanging fruit, inform people in the middle of the spectrum, make everybody move, mute opposition. Once again, understanding strategically this kind of stuff, this and this is where you need to invest your energy. Wasting your time and energy fighting your opponents is actually counterproductive. That also play in the hand where your opponent will do everything to push you away from the middle, portray you as extremist, portray you as radical, and then you lose the capability to mobilize the middle. But then, of course, know where you want to go. Too many movements fail because they are anti-corruption, anti-globalist, or anti-corrupt. Starting with anti will give you only to a certain part of the position you need to offer the alternative. Alternative that very often goes behind just defeating your opponent, but also goes into implementing this kind of change. So for this, you will need various people and you need to figure out how to manage this large parts of the coalition, how to maintain the unity. It sometimes can be Racial unity sometimes can be religious unity, sometimes it can be a unity of people that are thinking differently but can agree on a thing. And very often I'm playing this game with uh, local politics. Uh, you probably can find 2,000 different things in which liberals and conservatives are divided over in Colorado Springs. When you talk abortion, when you talk racism, when you talk uh, whatever, going to church versus being atheist. We're talking carry guns, actually. I had a marvelous feeling of security buying my juice in 7 Eleven with the two guys carrying this front flag and both of them being armed. I'm wondering what the heck they were afraid of in the 7 Eleven. <laughs> yeah, the chips were looking biting, they were terrified. <laughs> now, 
but when you take a look at these different people and take a look at the one issue, for example, climate change, you figure out that, you know, if you talk to the liberals, if you talk to the left, it's more about saving our planets and big goals and the quantity of CO2 and science. Okay, that's the language I know well. But then, two years ago, so and me, we were in a, well, we decided we want to spend the afternoon riding. And we went to Lake George, maybe an hour west from here, and he had amazing opportunity to spend two hours riding in the middle of nowhere. Uh, with a guy who told us the story of his life. Uh, he lived in Lake George for most of his life, and he moved to the town, which had 6,000 people. It was too big for him. So he came back to the Lake George. He owns a farm. He rents horses. He had some cattle. And, of course, socially, he's one of the most conservative people I've ever spoken to. And in the middle of the riding, because, you know, it's two hours, you don't have anything to do, it's really relaxed, he started talking about the draft and how the draft is becoming the big issue and how it is becoming the big, big issue even in his life. Because there is less grass, people need irrigation. Because irrigation costs, small farm owners cannot allow irrigation. Because the small farm owners cannot allow irrigation, the big companies are coming and buying the farms and that is changing his little environment forever. And now the people he grew with and who grandfathers have owned the farm in the Lake George are working in a you know software company in Colorado City or Denver and they sold their property. Well, draft has a lot to do with the climate change. <laughs> so now we are talking about something that tackles him and me. Though we are coming from a very different worlds of values, but maybe we can find common ground. Maybe he is going to become susceptible of thinking of replacing the big tractor with a small tractor, burning less oil. If he connects this to the ground. So when I'm saying it's like you need to figure out how to make a unity around your ideas, that also means listening. Non-violent struggle is about winning by numbers. Numbers are never in your, your little circle around. Numbers are somewhere else. And then, of course, you need to have strategy of inputting pillars. This is not about the tactics. Tactics are failing, tactics are how people get into the struggle. But if you really want to tackle things like systemic racism in this country, <coughs> stretch is far behind and stretches far behind very divisive slogans like defund police. You want to start with something less divided, for example, businesses getting paid equally for each job, where you're black, white, white. So this is less divisive, and you want to take a look at how the opening in the business is actually gave the very good opportunity to talk about this. But that opportunity was kind of missed now. Now taking a look at this, you want to move to the understanding that for successful change, you need successful targeting. And here are the two examples of it. One is, of course, fight for civil rights, Montgomery bus, boycott. People very often sip this lovely and drinkable story of a heroic woman named Rosa Parks that stand up in the bus because she didn't want to imply the segregation rule. In fact, that was the tactics of a carefully planned strategy. It was the black actors understanding that they cannot achieve the change through addressing le legislation in a place like Alabama, because the people in the governor's office were elected by the people who loved segregation, so it won't really work. And they instead of that, looking at the businesses, and specifically the businesses where they have leverage. And the public transportation was a no-brainer because the people of color were using it more than white people had cars. So withdrawing their support from that sector, they persuaded businesses to go to the governors and make the case that segregation doesn't pay off. And very similarly, two years ago after shooting in Parkland, Florida, the clever kids 
that mobilized around the assassination of their friends were clever enough to avoid demonstrating how gunfire control in front of the Florida's legislature. That would be a nice event to last for a day, but it will bear no fruit. Instead of that, they persuaded Walmart to export in goods, bus pro shops, and cabalas to start doing the background checks when they sell certain kinds of products. So targeting is very important. If you want to change things, instead of just looking at the big obstacle, you try to figure out how to bypass this obstacle. Also working with people, there is another, uh, yeah, these slides are just strange, they move. <laughs> yeah, this is the idea, you need more people, you need to recruit people at every point, you need to work with your people, you need to build the skills of these people, then you bring them into action. Violence hurts movements probably more than your opponent, specifically the violence uh, exercised by your own members. Nonviolent discipline is one of the three most important principles to get with unity and planning of successful nonviolent movements. So obviously when you take a look at this, you want to say, okay, it's very difficult to maintain nonviolent discipline when your opponent is shooting at you. It is very difficult, but it is achievable. Whether you are preaching on violence in a church like this, very popular method with civil rights movements, uh, whether you are training your people not to get involved in the violent situations, or you are even like we did in Serbia, protecting security forces from potentially violent members of your movement by your own bodies. So once again, police was arresting us, but we were making human chains between our demonstrations and the police. Because we know that if somebody attacks police, it's going to portray the whole movement as violent. This is where you lose reputation, this is where you lose steam, this is where you lose numbers. And this is eventually the small radical group overtakes the message, and this is how people see it. And once again, no chance to recruit from the network. Branding is important in business, it's important in, in uh, sales, it's also important with movements. The difference between movements and random protests is that they have vision, strategy, but they also have identity. And you, out of all people, because you're coming to this lovely church every Sunday, you know what feeling of community and identity is. You want to feel the people you're fighting with, you want to share with the people you're fighting with, you want to know that if things go south, there will be somebody to help your family, there will be somebody to pay for a lawyer, there is a solidarity, there is this organization that leaves no man or woman behind. And with that also comes the way you express to the outside, the way you do your visuals, the way you physically brand, all of these things matters. And they may look peripheral, but they are actually the nature of the successful movement. Uh, very often in life, in business, but also in movement, creativity is everything. And what we are particularly passionate about in Canvas is figuring out how people come to the amazing ideas. Because sometimes people invent these ideas themselves, or how the Americans say, reinvent the wheel. Sometimes they also learn horizontally from each other. But let's take a look at the one simple non-political thing as a potholes. And once again, you out of all people should understand <laughs> what the failing infrastructure means, yes? Yeah. Imagine I moved here, I have 15 days to buy a car, I need to buy a Buick Enclave. Because only the tank can survive a okay? This way, we're all going to locate in a large, ugly trucks. So, taking a look at a different way to measure this thing, and these are three examples. And in our latest book, we have 17 different examples, like 17 different tactics to tackle the problem. First one, this one I love. It comes from Russia, the Yekaterinburg, the third largest city in Russia. He had a mayor and a governor who promised that the potholes will be fixed till whatever, April 2012. And then of course it's November 2015 and the potholes are still there. 
And instead of demonstrating, people hired a local artist. This is the face of a mayor. This is the pothole. Because you live in Colorado Springs, you know what happens when you hit a pothole. You curse. <laughs> Even if you are the most well-spoken person in the country, this is automatic reaction. It has nothing to do with whether you are nice or it just happens. So now you have a personal curse. The beauty of it is that it personalizes the responsibility. Now, this is also the element of dilemma. If you are a mayor, what would you do? It is your face around each pothole in this city. And then you can you know, fix the potholes and grant your opponent a victory, or you as Russians can bring the machines, remove graffiti, and leave the potholes. In which case, of course, you're becoming a punchline. Now, from there into the technology world, this is Panama City, amazing place I visited only once. And aside of having a lot of these lawyers' offices, which are uh, making shell companies so rich people from around the world can, can wash their money, it's also a very, very fast growing city. So you get ended something with a Metro Denver downtown with a Pueblo infrastructure around. So you have all of these buildings and the streets, of course, are falling apart. So they hired an agency, really, really amazing guy, he's a Hungarian, who went there to come with this. And they came with a technological solution. Now, I assume you're living once again in Colorado, but you've seen the hockey pack. This thing that people are playing hockey with, this hard rubber thing. So somehow these machines can be put in a pothole. What happens when you hit the machine? It tweets. Hit a pothole, the machine tweets. And guess what? It tweets straight to the mayor's account. <laughs> Says I'm pothole number 102 at the corner of San Fran and Cascade and boom. I just heard the card of this lovely lady. Fix me, fix me, fix me. They go to 14,000 tweets a day. There's a lot of potholes. So now you're the mayor who, whose Twitter feed is that, you know, potholes are screaming at you every day. So, hey, once again, you can delete your Twitter account, you can ignore this, and the whole city will be laughing at you and you won't be reelected. Or you can fix the pothole and grant the people who came with a prank and convicted. This is not the end. In Serbia, we are planting plow flowers in the potholes. In Zim, there is a guy we know from Bulawayo. The potholes are serious there, as you can see. So he planted the trees. Well, it's really useful. You see the tree, you would hear the pothole, okay? And then at the same time, it gives you the idea about the size of the infrastructure of decay. If you can plant a forest, you know, where you would drive a car. In Brazil, there is a group that regularly celebrates the birthday of a pothole in Sao Paulo every year with a cake and a party. In Montreal, the pothole was filled with water, turned into the pond, pond and the fish was introduced. <laughs> so once again, different ways to tackle this, all coming from creativity, all coming from a very deep understanding on how you structure things. Now, these things are not only funny, they're also super brilliantly intelligent because they put your opponent between the rock Rock, ignore the tweets, ignore the pothole. Hard place, fix the thing and deliver the victory. So we can come up for you when it comes to whatever street lines. So take a look at this. It tells you that creativity matters, but strategic thinking is also part of the show. We love humor. We used to paint Milosevic on a petrol barrel, bring the barrel into the main shopping zone, put the hole in it, you can put the coin, and like in a pinball game, you buy yourself right to take a bat, hit Mr. President, and express your love for him. And of course, that's not the funny part. The funny part is what police does when police arrives. There is nobody to be arrested. When they arrest the barrel, they look like idiots. Fast forward to Russia, where protests are not allowed, the snowmen and toys are protested. 
So instead of arresting the people and accusing them for terrorism and you know destroying the public order, in Barnaul, Siberia, the police had to ban the protest of plastic toys. <laughs> and we are talking about the guy who loved posing shirtless, wrestling bears and tigers, saving volcanoes from drowning. For God's sake, you have an annual calendar of shirtless Putin. You can buy on Amazon. He's afraid of toys. <laughs> so now you're looking at how adding humor to your thing also work. Too much of the protest is perceived as anger, division, hate, discontent, agitation. But when you make it funny and cheerful, there are more chances that the common people from the middle will participate in it. Well, last but not the least importance, uh, you need to finish what you start. Uh, our data shows that, and also our experience, because we worked in Egypt and so many different countries, is that it's easier to get to your goal than to make your change permanent. And it may sound like lunacy when you say it's easier to build from 11 people to 20,000 people than to, you know, solve the problems after you went. Actually, most of movements die in transitional phase. They are capable of making the bad guys step down, but they are incapable to build durable and stable change after that. There are many reasons for that that I can talk about later. So without further ado, uh, what you can do to help is normally the way we operate is we'll take a look at the core group. Core group is actually what writes to Canvas in the first place and say, we want to do something in Zambia. And then work on building skills of the group and help strategic and tactical planning. And then you can teach them how it is important to talk to the others. This is a very difficult part. They, they, as clever and as committed as these small groups be, they're actually very reluctant to grow. So this is where the big thing is that you need to go to provinces and talk to this guy in Lake George. You need him. This is the tough part. And then, of course, be there for them in the moments of despair. The most difficult part, make sure the job is done. Whatever it is, this is what we do for a living. This is what Solve and me are teaching students. And it's maybe not the, your typical job that you imagine, but it's full of thrill and uh, non-material compensation for what you do. Because when you work with troublemakers, you're actually working with the best part of society. The people who are pushing society forward and who always learn. Thank you for your attention. I intentionally missed America from this presentation. But happy to talk about it or whatever you want. Except singing. <laughs> Terror, which proved to be true, but that last person probably huge hockey arena could have done through humor to have stopped that. So what, what the question was, what can be done through humor to stop what? Hockey arena. Hockey arena. Oh. Okay, so shall I answer this or Slobo can answer this? So, first of all, hockey arena is built on a place, as you all know, where the best and my favorite cop shop for yes. women. Yes. So, man, losing Woolens is a bummer. Okay. Then, on the top of it, they decided this year's class uh, that Sol and I teach will be done in the hockey arena. So, I'm actually teaching out of hockey arena, <laughs> which comes with amazing uh, 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 revelations. First of all, there is not a place you can drink coffee 300. Uh, 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 well, I, I, I don't know, 15 years. Like, you need to go into the college to learn from the Second, when we were warned by the number of the cases growing, you need to move from whatever that means, a hybrid way of teaching, 
which means two of our are in classroom, some students are in classroom, and some students are home, internet connection. <laughs> so, this is a good question. I think actually this large infrastructural project is where people can really learn from successful things. So, taking a look at various levels of this, and this probably, like, if you're passionate about this, you probably go and read something called Boycott Nest. So Nestle Boycott was the first international successful attempt to screw up the greedy corporation. And the corporation, of course, produces most of the chocolate and the Nescafe I have in the morning. And they were making some really, really toxic crap, which was called the baby formula, but gave a lot of defects in Africa. So when people mobilized and said, let's go to the arena, they were not fighting Nestle in Kenya where they, they had the programs of first saving moms not to breastfeed so they could buy their shit. I'm serious. Yeah. They were looking at other places where Nestle is doing things. So taking a look at when they need to open a new factory, they'll send 50 activists to ask questions. Uh, when the new shop is open, they will send people inside the shop and they will put stickers with the African babies with two cats on each Nestle product. They were micro-targeting the Nescafe, which was the best selling thing. Like, the thing is like, for 15 years, for 15 years, they were arrested the large corporation. There was, it's also a very weird coalition from health organizations and left liberals to the very conservative churches across the globe. And they won. So take a look at, at the arena, take a look at these big infrastructural projects, take a look at your demands and what needs to be there. Taking a look at, this is really serious thing, and we all need, like I would say you need, like something about it, because I'm living here. Uh, beware of gentrification trend. It can kill this. It has killed many cities before this. It has still killed the bigger cities, the stronger cities, the more active cities. How many of you have ever been to San Francisco? How many of you have been to San Francisco in the last five years? There is a book about it, it's called I Hate Internet. <laughs> and what whatever comes from the Silicon Valley. So taking a look at how to defend the way of life. And yes, you need money, yes, you need small business. I mean, this is no brainer. Clever people making money coming to your place is a good thing. But preventing clever people coming from your place to buy the city center and kill everything else. And then you end with 20,000 homes who are talking to the street to, to, to themselves. And they look like they took acid in 1978 and, and never get all that thing. I'm serious. Been there two years ago. So I'm telling you what I've seen. And been there 25 years ago. So my best man lives in so throw their all. Take a look at the arena, take a look at what you missed, take a look at the next arena, and try to think how to mobilize the people around the values without being portraying that you're stopping the progress. Because this will be labeled as somebody who's stopping progress. And yes, all we need in downtown is a big hockey place where 5,000 people can congregate. And then, of course, we need to ban parking everywhere around. It's a match, yes? Oh, yes. So, taking a look at this, and especially when it comes like the things like, you would find people to talk in the college. Like, I think a lot of this college development is about uh, them sitting on piles of money, and then them trying to improve the college facilities, and then ending up in a, in a building large things. Sometimes these things are amazing and I had this long and very painful conversation with people but then you know there is there is an argument. There is an argument why you need affordable housing there is an argument why you need America is beautiful part. So, but you know getting involved, getting active this is what gives the power of the society and I think this uh, this can particularly work here like in, 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 in Wild West. Okay, sorry. 
for calling my new home the Wild West. I don't think you are leveraging enough or understanding how blessed you are with the fact that you believe in community. Okay, so this is serious. I found myself a community here, and when I talk to the people from where I'm coming from, they would tell me, oh, they're trained to be nice. They're not trained to be nice. They're trained to be nice in Boston. <laughs> they're actually hating your guts. They're intellectual and arrogant. They, 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 but they need to be nice in order to sell your home. Here, you guys came here on the wagons with horses. You need to learn how to make a circle to defend yourself from the animals. And then cut the fence. And then kill a deer. And then kill a bear. Well, you didn't kill all bears. The city is full of them. But you learn how to cooperate through the community. You have a unique thing. A community in this place is almost genetic. So you need to use this thing to prevent the community before you turn into the ball. Okay? You don't want to be bold. Okay. Um, when you started out, or near the beginning of your presentation, when you were talking about failed democracies, uh -huh. I mean, it makes me wonder, and I'm not a student of political science, so I can't speak very intelligently to the varieties of democracies, but I, I wonder if there's something fundamental in our form of democracies that need to be changed to make them more effective and long-lasting and less likely, including in America, to not survive. Mm. That's a great question. First of all, I hear you, I have an MA in fresh war biology. <laughs> so I only accidentally teach political science class. I will actually tell you more about the mating habits of bus <laughs> and crap. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> this is a really interesting question. So one part of the question is that democracy has its flaws, but it's still the best system we have in life. And history teaches us, not only from uh, no-brainers, like democracies don't go to war with democracies, to start with. Not only in terms of, you know, how you nurture talent, how you nurture human capital, which is actually the, the, the future of the world. It's not about commodities, they will go off. There will be a day where every single house, like skies, will have this beautiful solar power panels in the top. Look at this guy. It's my idea. It's all good. Let me pay utilities. So, taking a look at these things, like there is no universal model how democracy works, but there is a universal rule that the more people participate and you know request checks and balances from their government, democracy is more alive. So, whether you're using a very advanced European, uh, Northern European, Scandinavian model, where you have uh, not too many rules and not too many policing of the people, if you want, but a lot of people are actually, you know, if there are 50 fish in front and there is a 40 of us, nobody will take two fish. People just obey the rules, that's how they are. That's not because there is a camera, you know, checking if you took two. It's because people don't need more than one, and they'll just take one, even if they can take two, and there is a temptation. On the other side of it, you have a heavily forced system of obeying the rules. You guys are playing in the league of Iran and Saudi Arabia when it comes to the number of the inmates per capita. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Between here and the beautiful stretch of Arkansas River, you can bypass, what, three, four, five private jails? So are you enforcing it this way or are you enforcing it that way? This is a different approach. But in every single case, there is a correlation between whether people participate in democracy or not, 
the less people participate in democracy, the less people question decisions, the less people get outraged about the, the, the hockey arenas of this world, the easier it is for people on power to abuse. This is this goes across the religion and races and continents. It's like Modi came to power as a nice populist in India. For the two and a half years, the majority of Indians didn't really pay attention. Now they're the leading country in shrinking freedoms. Because the traditional democracy was about one billion people. So of course it impacts the world more when something happened in Maldives. Maldives are 500,000. Taking a look at this, is now the people are starting to take this government accountable. So make sure you participate. Institutions are important, but no democratic institutions will hold on if the people abandon them. They won't hold on only because it's crime in the Constitution. You will end up in a marvelous quote of a Venezuelan leader, Hugo Chavez. Oh, epitome of that quote is something that Slovo and me have been living in for years. Chavez is known to say, for my friends, everything, for my enemies, law. So laws are there to be imposed to those who are not in a ruling circle. For them, there are no laws. They can do whatever they want. But that's because there is no check and balance. I have a follow-up question, actually, because, you know, you say that people need to participate, but about half of our uh, Congress has decided to put in about 400 different, uh, make it diff more difficult for people to vote. So I'm looking at that, and I'm looking around, and I don't see the outrage of the people that are being affected by this at all. I don't understand why they don't see that our, our, very, our very foundation of democracy is at stake when people can't vote. Can you speak to that? Uh, first of all, it's not the half of your Congress, it's half of your governors. <laughs> this, is where the, this is what is really dangerous. So it's like, the, well, I mean, there is a really cool uh, four or five episode documentary about voting on Netflix, which actually explained how American voting system is screwed up to start with. And it's, and it's funny. And it's 20 minutes episodes, and you can watch them before you go to sleep. They're very easy to watch. Uh, basically, I think there are two elements in this. One element, uh, you have a really weird voting system. Like, this is it's probably the only place in the world. It's like, and, and and kind of out of date because you know the Civil War was so long ago that you don't really need to pump up Arkansas with the same number of senators as California in order to prevent them to secede from the United States of America. I mean, this is why this thing was there. Like this idea that each country is represented by the equal number of senators, regardless of the size. And then of course you have this winner take it all electoral college thing which makes your vote in Colorado, actually this is the largest inflation. 15 years ago, they would spend, what, $150, $220 per campaign for a vote in Colorado. Now, because it's considered to be solid blue in presidential elections, the parties are spending $20. But in Florida, they spend $350 because it's purple. So it's like taking a look at this, it tends with your vote being less important or more important regarding where you see. And then taking a look at how the you know, state senate, state, uh, state house, then the gerrymandering, and then on the top of it, you see restrictions to vote. So one thing is making restrictions to vote. Republican governors are making restrictions to vote because they have a shrinking voting base. And they will want the same results with the smaller numbers. This is political engineering 101. More black people vote. Oh, they can't vote on Sunday before the elections because there are skies of this world that tend to pop them in the buses and then take them to the polling places and places like Georgia. Once again, this can be overwhelmed by participation. So but me, we are coming from the country. We're in 2000. 
You can vote, but nobody can follow where this vote goes. You can vote, but government can stuff 300,000 votes. So the only way you can go over the attempts to suppress the vote is by voting more. Yes, you can protest. Yes, you can address these things. Yes, it all helps. It puts a big price tag on it, like this brave uh, black woman that whose name I forgot who came to this ingenious ideas when the governor of Georgia was locked in his uh, 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 office and signing this restrictive law. She just was knocking on the door and keep knocking on the door until she was arrested and she was a state representative so she had every right to be in that building so she staged a big thing it's like typical Dana action. The thing is Yes, you need to put the price tag on this. But the only way to overwhelm it is to say, I'm not tired of staying in line and getting to vote. And you know, it's like Colorado, you know how long you have this amazing way of voting whenever you want by like 15 years. How many people voted two weeks ago? And to see fell. How many people? All they had to do is to put. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so no voting system can prevent you from losing good thing on a, if there is no participation. How many people vote on the local elections last year? 32, 35 percent. Yeah. This is what I'm saying. So it's like the thing is like the one thing is to allow more people to vote, and I agree it's very important. Another thing, prevent those that restrict the case to vote. And then, then, but all of it will fail. You can have the best access, accessibility to vote in the country and still not vote. It's about break, changing the minds of the people, understanding that they matter. Okay, too much for talks, so time for singing. Thank you. We'll see you next week. For uh, next week is John Hunter on uh, God in Place in Colorado Springs. And now Sky, he's going to really sing. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just dancing.